morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Max Kobe Little Orthodox Channel. This is another Escaping Atheism video. This is Chapter 6 of Atheists Always Lie. The atheist lie that there is, quote-unquote, no proof for God or religion. I'm sorry, but that's a lie. As I would mention to people, if you're interested in previous episodes of this series, previous chapters, I'll include a link in the low bar and on escapingatheism.com, the, uh, the, the link to the playlist of every bit of Atheists Always Lie series right here. So if, for example, you are saying there's no proof in science for God or there, there's no evidence for, si for, for God in science or that science has this proven, you know, proven we don't need to have any need for God, blah, 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 you might want to look through the previous ones and the previous ones I've mentioned on history too. So the fact of the matter is, is that when atheists talk about the religion, they, they invariably lie about it. Uh, they, they almost invariably anyway mostly by omission, mostly by false shading, by pretending religion is anti-science, pretending that religion is anti-human rights, etc. Before we get into some of the more classical evidence for God, I want to point out a couple of things. One, while we have ample evidence in science that there has to be a God, we have it all over the place in multiple fields of science, from multiple types of physics to medical science to, to even evolutionary biology. I know there's some Christians who are doggedly anti-evolution, but it turns out if you start looking hard enough in ev evolutionary biology, evidence for God also becomes overwhelming there. It's, it's really funny. The problem with that is that scientific proof is more shaky and can be overturned at any time. Now, I think if you look at the previous installments of Atheists Always Lie, you'll see the science I've referenced is very mainstream. It's not even that particularly edgy, most of it. And so most of it looks like it's going to be here to stay, the Big Bang, the cosmological constant the overwhelming data on near-death experience and the evidence in neurology for the existence of a soul, it's all there. But since it's sub science, it's subject to being overturned at any time. And it's subject to being challenged at any time. That's one of the things about science, by the way. Unlike God and stable, sane religion, science can turn on a dime. In fact, science is often very dependent on the cultural assumptions of the people doing the science, at least as to how they set their priorities and what their starting assumptions of as, about what's, what's valid and what's not or what's, what's, what's needed or what's not. The fact of the matter is, however, people have had evidence that there is a God for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. If you look very carefully, for example, just accepting modern anthropological, archaeological assumptions as they are, we have evidence that people have been worshiping spirit forces of some sort for more than 30,000 years. See the interview I did with the pagan witch on that or some of the other pagans. The, the data in anthropology is overwhelming that people are normally and naturally spiritual. In fact, I'm going to just show you this nice, this nice picture I just picked up because it sets a nice tone. Religion is a part of what it means to be a human being. And that is absolutely true. There is, in fact, rational evidence to believe in the spiritual. There is totally rational reason to believe there is a God. These are rational things to believe. We also know for a fact, within all reasonable likelihood, that certain famous religious figures, the Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus, who, said, who all changed the world. We know these men actually existed, and don't let anybody lie to you and say they didn't. Of course they did. The debate is to how truthful is what they say and all that. In any case, even going outside of these types of religions, all you have to do is look and see that this is natural human behavior. It is simply natural human behavior. Natural healthy human behavior, by the way, as we've mentioned in other sources and in other streams, religious people do live longer. 
they tend to be happier. They have fewer mental health problems. They have more stable lives. They have more stable jobs. They have more stable families. They're less likely to be depressed. They're less likely to have mental illness. They're less likely to go to jail. By the way, if you've heard anything to the contrary, you have been listening to demonstrable propaganda. The science is overwhelming that it's unnatural to be atheist. So the question that the smart person should be asking is, all right, well, we can look at people who may or may not, I'm not, I don't want to imply that anybody in this picture, here, let me stop sharing for a moment. You can imply all you want, and, and probably rightly so, that there are lots of religious people out there who are not very bright. Now, it's easily debunked the idea that atheists are smarter in general or have high IQs in general, they, higher IQs in general. They do not. Not any realistically meaningful sense. That's more propaganda, I'm afraid, easily debunked. However, it's going to be true that there are people who aren't very bright, who aren't very intelligent, who aren't very educated. They will tend to be religious, and those folks quite frequently will have a very time, hard time articulating for you why they believe what they believe. That does not, however, make them wrong, which is why, by the way, it is incredibly nasty and abusive to sit there and simply insult somebody's religious beliefs, especially if you happen to be quicker-witted or more glib-tongued, and you, you're going to pick on the person who's not as bright as you and make them feel bad about themselves and make them feel inferior. And, or, make the, or worse, you're going to condescendingly pretend that you are leading them to some sort of wisdom by dishonestly talking themselves out of a rational proposition that the spiritual and supernatural are real and that there is a God. Whether God matters or not is another matter. That's a difference between religions. But in reality, most religions recognize in the broadest sense that there is a God. So here's the thing, you've met people who, aren't, who, are, who believe in God, regardless of religion. You've met people who believe in God. Some aren't very bright, some aren't very articulate, some are just terrible explaining things. What you would do if you were an honest atheist or just an honestly curious person is find people who are at least as smart as you, if not smarter. And, and I would say look for smarter, and that means you have to, of course, get away from the narcissistic atheist tendency to say there is no one smarter than you. Look for somebody smarter to talk to you about why they actually believe what they believe. I'm going to give you some good starting points, however. I know a lot of you young atheists today talk about wanting to save civilization. If so, you know, save Western civilization, save the Western values you want to, you know, preserve against either Islam or some other political force you need, you, you're opposed to. But in reality, if you're against, if you're just dogmatically and arrogantly against religion and religious people, you're going to fail. And what's worse is you're going to look dumb. And I'm going to tell you straight up now, the Escaping Atheism team continues to grow. We've got like four new volunteers this week. And the, the fact of the matter is atheists look really dumb these days to a whole lot of people because they believe things about religion that simply aren't true, and they believe things about the discussion about God that simply aren't true. Leaving aside all the evidence in current science for God, which is massive and multivalent and easily checked through the peer-reviewed sources, the fact is, is that since science can be overturned, what you really want to be looking at is the classical proof for God, ultimately. This, in fact, is what scientists would benefit most from. This is what anybody who's a science maven would benefit from. I'm going to recommend the works of Aristotle and Plato. Let me explain, explain these men to you. They are not Christians. They are not Jews. They are not Muslims. They are not Hindus. Odds are Aristotle and Plato probably wouldn't have approved of the Jewish religion. They might have, but, but I don't think they would have been real fond of it. And I, you know, they may or may not, well, I think they probably would have appreciated Christianity if they got to know it, but they came long before Jesus and they weren't Jews. And, and the religions within Greece at the time where they were from tended to vary a lot. And so, you know, I mean, some were more serious than others, but neither, neither, the, neither of these great thinkers that I'm going to recommend to you were ever all that religious. They weren't anti-religious at all, but they were never all that religious. I believe that when you're investigating this sort of thought, 
you want to pick either Plato or Aristotle as your starting point. These thinkers will make you understand quite a few things. They'll make you think more clearly. You'll find that they were wrong about a few things, but very few, and easily identified what they were wrong about. Most of what they wrote, almost impossible to refute, and has stood the test of time for thousands of years, completely independent of any religion. If you're more Aspie type, engineering type, really hard, cold, brute logic type, I generally would recommend starting with play, with Aristotle, which is, and, and, and here's one book you could possibly start with. You can ask around for others, but a good book is probably this well-reviewed, The Basic Works of Aristotle. I'll be honest, I haven't read this particular work. I struggled to find a well-reviewed introductory basic work on Aristotle, and this came up highly recommended on Goodreads, so we'll take them on faith. Uh, you will discover all sorts of things here, such as within Aristotle, such as why do you believe the things you believe, the whole basic idea of what is called metaphysics, and, and you should never laugh at metaphysics. You can't do physics without proper metaphysics. You can't do more than primitive basic physics without metaphysics anyway. And it will change the way you see things. Aristotle also thought there had to be a god. Now, again, watch out for the slippery atheist tendency to say, you mean your God? Which God? Why do I believe your God? That's always dishonest when atheists do it. I mean, really, especially after you've explained it to them. Philosophically, even scientifically, theologically, independent of religion, God is a universal concept. So even if you come to believe that there is a God, you don't have to pick up any religion at all. Aristotle had no religion. He knew there had to be a God. And he over and over again showed how physics doesn't work without a God, ethics don't work without a God, morals don't work without a God. You have to assume one. Although, again, you have to stop thinking like a primitive child. When people say God, they don't mean Thor. What they mean is the thing that runs reality, the ultimate intelligence or ultimate source that everything didn't just come from in the beginning, but that's responsible for it all continuing to go the way it goes now. The philosopher is saying the, unconditioned, the uncontingent source of contingent being, but that's, okay, those are, those are a little bit, those are big words for uh, some people, and the way I like to put it is, again, the thing that's making reality go. God, the thing that is responsible for logic working, the thing that is responsible for the laws of probability and physics working. And Aristotle is a real good go-to guy on that. It is a fact, by the way, not an opinion, that a ton of scientists, I mean a ton, in physics, in biology, and other fields, have recently, have in the last 10 years, been rediscovering Aristotle and the subject of teleology and the very ne necessary idea, or at least very useful idea of the prime mover, and quite a bit else by rediscovering Aristotle. Because you know what? If you don't re-examine re your starting assumptions, your, your science stalls eventually, which is what's happened in most of science, by the way. So if you're that kind of person, I recommend some of the basic works of Aristotle. Make, not, don't just be, you know, get a good global, if you don't buy this one, make sure it gets something that is an overview of all of his big work, not just one obscure subject. If, on the other hand, you're not the science uh, uh, you know, engineering type, brute logic type, a better place to start might be Plato. Now, do not get me wrong. Plato is very logical. I guess I would just say with, with love that Aristotle's more Asperger-ish, <laughs> more autistic. I'm not saying he was, but I mean just a lot more brute. Here's here this, there A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F, then G. It's a lot more Aristotle. In Plato's case, Plato is a lot more cerebral. He's more conceptually oriented. So those of you who like to get something like the big picture, the concepts, the ideas that under, under, underlie things, Plato is your man. Plato, using similar but in many ways very different ways of looking at things also wound up in the same conclusion. There simply had to be a God. The universe made no sense without one. And by the way, I dare you to read Plato and come away and say that was a primitive mind that didn't understand things very well. 
no, I'm sorry, if you're listening to this, I don't care how high your IQ is, Plato's was higher. Ditto Aristotle. Don't even try. Seriously. In fact, I, I, honestly, although I'm not, I don't mean this literally. Literally, if some atheist tries to say these are primitive ancient minds with ancient scribblings, what they should be popped in the mouth for just being insolent, ignorant children. Because really, for people who claim to be open-minded and free thinkers, the idea that you could shrug off two of the most influential thinkers in human history for more than 2,300 years going, influencing Muslim culture, Christian culture, pagan culture, certain other cultures, you think you can just you can just shrug off Plato? You're an idiot. Don't be an idiot. Even smart atheists like Nietzsche and Hume knew you had to take on Plato if you were going to be a serious atheist. You had to take on Plato and or Aristotle. They knew that because these guys are brilliant and they'll cause you to re-examine life. Plus, by the way, Socrates is awesome whenever they write about Socrates. Especially, I especially recommend finding Socrates' apology, the apology for Socrates that, 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 that Plato wrote. In these, you will find many of the standard classical evidence for God, evidence that has stood for thousands of years unrefuted. And by the way, they weren't even the, we also know from documentation, they weren't the only ones to come up with the idea. Non-Jewish people independently all over the globe all came to the idea, something big and intelligent is running everything, which is what the idea of God is. So you can stop being such primitives. Something big ultimately running everything would have to be infinite, would have to be beyond time and beyond space, and would have to be basically made out of thought or concept. I, th I'm sorry, that is what most people have meant by God for thousands of years, and it is not a primitive idea. If you want to get more direct and modern and somebody who's hip on all the modern philosophers, as well as somebody who knows all the, the atheist philosophers, got to recommend this recently re released book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God by Professor Edward Faser. This man is well read on all the latest stuff all the moderns, all the Enlightenment thinkers, all of them, and here in this brand new edition, restates the five standard classic proofs that no one has ever overturned for over 800 years from Thomas Aquinas, five proofs of the existence of God. I leave this as a standing challenge to any atheist who's got the guts to read it, digest it, and then come to his own conclusions without having his atheist buddies or his favorite atheist gurus tell him what to think in advance. Read this book. Not everybody has to be a scholar. It's wrong to pick on people who just are simple folk and have come to the, ra to the conclusion that there's a God because instinctively they know there's one. By the way, his you know, scientific data overwhelmingly affirms it's normal for people to develop a natural sense of God as early as age two, and by the way, it would be a it would be child abuse to simply tell the child that that is a, 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 a wrong natural belief that they came to, because the evidence is overwhelming that it's not the same as invisible friends and monsters in the closet and Santa Claus. It's really not. In any case, once you match that natural normal sense of God, Karen Armstrong called it the numinous. The Eastern Orthodox Christians like to call it the noose. The ancient uh, Western church like to call it the sensus divinatus. The vast majority of humans are born with an instinctive, innate understanding that something intelligent seems to be running the universe. People come to that conclusion as naturally as they pick up language or as, and as naturally as they, they develop things like spontaneous dancing or very basic math like two plus two. That census divinatus, that idea that there's a God, totally normal in humans. If people can't articulate why they believe it, really smart people can. And I'll recommend the five proofs of the existence of God. And really, I'll recommend one other thing. I'm breaking stride here. 20, 20 proofs for the existence of God. Peter Kreef put up 
something a few years ago called 20 Classical Proofs for the Existence of God. Oh, I'm doing this uh, spontaneously, uh, but I'll just do it. By the way, we do still need your support, higher production values, and higher in in donations will let me quit my job and do this more. Here, I'll re recommend this in the show too, 20 Arguments for the Existence of God. A dumb claim you'll hear from atheists is that arguments are not proof or arguments are not evidence. That is BS on multiple levels. First off, arguments are evidence. They stand up in court and they stand up in science all the time. Second, you don't, this is just the way they've chosen to phrase it. You could say proof of God from change instead of argument. It winds up being the same. These are 20 ancient ones, including one of my least one, the Kalam argument, which I've never liked that argument. I've never been a big fan of William Lane Craig's just almost obsession with it, it seems. Other arguments for God have always made sense. But in any case, all 20 of these on Peter Kreef's cage all have stood for many centuries, some for thousands of years. So if you don't want to get the book, here's my challenge for the smart atheist. Pick two or three of these. No, pick at least three of these. Master them. Learn them. And even see if you can defend them so that even if you don't believe them, you can say you fully thought through the hardest, deepest, most logical proofs for God that, that, that theists can muster. But to do that honestly, you'll have to say, you'll have to be able to answer a theist's questions on it. You should be able to defend an argument you don't believe in. So master at least three of these. Two I don't like are the calm argument and I hate the ontological argument. In fact, what I find is that most people hate the ontological argument, even though it's never been disproved. And a lot of people feel the Kalam argument is very limited. All the others here are very good, though. And those aren't bad arguments. I suggest you pick two. I, 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 personally, the argument from intelligibility means something. But again, you'll even find that one of the classical arguments is the argument from religious experience. It's been observed for thousands of years that being religious is normal and having religious experience is normal. By the way, modern psychiatrists and psychologists have never, ever, ever come close to proving that religious experiences are entirely electrochemical effects or psychology or delusion. Anybody making that assertion is not making a scientific assertion. And if they're a mental health professional, they, they have an ethics problem, and you might want to seek a, a more ethical and honest mental health provider if they're going to lie to you and pretend that religion is just delusion. Okay, I think we've gone on long enough here. What I wanted to get across to you today is that it is not, not only normal for people to be religious, and I didn't even say Christianity, I just said religious. It is normal for people to be religious. It is healthy for people to be religious. And it is rude and nasty and bullying and hateful in many cases. If you as a moderately high IQ or just silver tongue glib bastard can abuse a less intelligent person than yourself who has a normal, natural, rational idea that there is a God, but can't articulate it for you, so you somehow win. No, that just makes you awful. It makes you an awful human being when you do that to people who are less smart than you. If you're going to be a, a, a doubter, stop pretending religious belief is irrational just because people who aren't quite as bright as you or, or glib-tongued as you can't articulate things to your satisfaction. Have the balls to engage the minds that are at least as smart as you, if not smarter. If you have the guts to do that, you'll be more of a man if you're male. You'll have more integrity if you're a woman. Sorry to be sexist, but seriously, if you're going to be an atheist, have some uh, integrity and master the arguments from the other side so that you really understand them. Watch out, though, because you might accidentally fall in. Because while the evidence from modern science is overwhelming that there has to be a God and we have to have a soul, but prior to any of that modern science that I've mentioned, we have had rational evidence for thousands of years. In fact, I'll just leave you with this closing thoughts. Atheists like to talk as if they are the avatars in charge of science. They aren't, but they like to talk that way. They also make proclamations. For example, they'll say that you can't challenge an existing theory without having you know, existing established 
theory and science. You can't challenge it unless you have a good reason to challenge it. That is something atheists say. That is something some scientific naturalists say. I don't necessarily agree with it, but let's be clear. It's a common claim in scientific naturalist land that you must have a valid reason to challenge an existing theory before you may do so, if, as long as it's an established theory. Well, in reality, for thousands of years, independent of any religion, the vast majority of scientists have agreed that the universe makes the most sense with a god and that, uh, that positing a god makes science make more sense than dismissing the idea of a god. Therefore, the, the idea that there is a god has been the standing theory for thousands of years. Recently, moderns have been trying to claim that we have the burden of proof. Hey, if you want to play that, that stinking lousy burden of proof game, which isn't all that honest to begin with, but hey, let's, let's have you play by your own rules, atheists. You have a burden of proof here. The standing theory, and well tested, by the way, for thousands of years has been that there must be an intelligence, there must be an ultimate force, ultimately responsible for all of reality continuing to operate the way it does. That has been the default theory. And a majority of the world's scientists actually do support that theory still even today. What is your justification, atheists, for saying that we should ditch the idea that there is an ultimate prime mover for your ludicrous idea of a random, causeless, unintelligent universe randomly just kind of goes that way? Because that's what atheists believe. And this, again, is why I say I, Hinduism makes more sense than atheism. Shintoism makes more sense than atheism. The paganistic shamanism makes more sense than atheism. Islam makes more sense than atheism. In fact, Islam's less violent than ideological atheists are when they get power. So there you go, kids. If you want to get honest about religion, atheists, stop pretending you're smarter and stop pretending there's no evidence or no proof. We've always had evidence, we've always had proof, we've always had logic and evidence and intelligent, really intelligent people on our side on this because God is a rational conclusion based on evidence and the random causeless universe makes more sen no sense. Final shout out, again, I'm going to strongly recommend if you want to get serious as an intellectual, read either some of the basic works of Aristotle or the essential dialogues or essential works of Plato. I dare you to do it, master the material, or if you've really got some guts, go ahead and dive right into Ed Fazer's Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Just watch out, Mr. Atheist. You might fall in and realize it makes rational sense to believe there's a God after all. Okay, everybody. This week we've got some lots, lots of fun stuff going on. We're going to have an, a, 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 a street epistemologist atheist on named Jordan on Wednesday. Scooter down. He's going to come in and tell us our his journey home. We're going to have on Rob from Deflating Atheism. Our dance card is very full this week, so stay tuned. We'll be here every day. And God bless. Oh, and please remember, like, subscribe, support our work financially and otherwise. I'll be Maria.